Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to cover a broad approach to shoulder x-rays, specifically in the setting of trauma. And before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that a large portion of this talk actually comes from the work of Nigel Raby and Lawrence Berman in their book, Accident and Emergency Radiology, A Survival Guide. I highly recommend this book. It's concise, it's clear, and if you're working in an emergency department or if you're a radiologist who's seeing trauma scans, this book will be invaluable in your practice. So I'm gonna link it in the description below if you want to check it out. So we're gonna start with our most common view, uh, the view that any department will do in a person complaining of trauma and pain in the shoulder, and this is the AP view. So the patient's sitting directly uh, facing the x-ray machine. We've got um, the x-rays coming from the anterior and being the plate being behind posteriorly. Just to orientate ourselves, we've got here our clavicle coming across towards our acromion, anteriorly forward is our coracoid process, our shallow glenoid fossa, behind our scapula coming here, medial border of the scapula there, our humerus with our humeral head sitting within the glenoid fossa. And then we've got our ribs here, our chest cavity, our spine, and soft tissues here. Now when we look at an AP view on a shoulder x-ray, we need to ask ourselves five questions. The and, and as we go through cases later on, you're gonna see why these five questions become important. The first thing we want to look at is to see if the inferior border of the distal clavicle is in line with the inferior border of the acromion. So in this case, it is. The second question we need to ask ourselves is, is the coracoclavicular joint more than 13 millimeters? If it is, then that's abnormal here. It's less than 13 millimeters, so that's normal. The next question we need to ask is where is our humeral head sitting? Is it sitting within the glenoid cavity or in the glenoid fossa, or is it sitting inferior to our coracoid process? And here, yes, it's in the glenoid fossa, which is good. The fourth question we need to ask ourselves is does the uh, humeral head have this almost walking stick orientation? Is there this angulation here. When we take an AP x-ray, the patient should be in slight external rotation. What that does is it brings the humeral head around and gives it this characteristic shape. If it's not in that shape, then we need to suspect something such as a posterior uh, dislocation. And the last question we need to ask ourselves is, is there any evidence of fractures on this view? And in this case, I can't see any evidence of fractures. So we could look at this x-ray and say, this is a normal shoulder x-ray. But as we know, we can't look at a single view, especially when looking at the shoulder. It's such a complex joint that we need at least two views and one view is one view too few. So what views do we have available to ourselves? Well, I'm gonna cover two common views. The first is this apical oblique view. Now, this is really helpful in the, the setting of trauma because the patient can actually sit comfortably while this x-ray is being taken. The x-ray beam is angled at about 45 degrees down onto the patient and so apical, 45 degrees down, and with an angle oblique like this, so it's going away from the patient with our detector here on the, on the other side. And what we get here is we can see that our clavicle is coming across towards our acromion here. Here's our acromion sitting here with our clavicle. Now on this view, we can't see uh, whether the inferior border of the clavicle meets the inferior border of the acromion, and we can never look on that view. The only time is on an AP view. We can see our shallow glenoid fossa here, and if we look carefully, our coracoid process coming anteriorly, and then our humeral head sitting within that glenoid fossa. Now this is also a great view for assessing for fractures. It's a completely different view from our AP view. So a fracture that may be hidden on the AP may be seen here on the apical oblique view. What we want to do here is we want to draw a line from the superior part of our glenoid to the in sorry, to the inferior part of our glenoid like this, and then draw a triangle that makes up our glenoid fossa. Now, if we were to bisect this uh, portion of the triangle from the apex through that portion of the triangle, that should go right through the center of our uh, humeral head. If the humeral head is displaced forward like this, we can suspect an anterior dislocation. If it's displaced backwards there, we can suspect a posterior dislocation. Another view that we can do is called the Y view or the lateral scapular view. What that requires is a patient to uh, face the, the, 
um, the x-ray detector and have the x-ray coming from behind them, they're slightly extending that shoulder backwards like this, and the x-ray is coming through the scapula this way. So we're seeing the scapula end on, and now this is a completely orthogonal view to our AP view and can give us a lot of information as to where the humerus sits in relation to the scapula. And the main thing we need to see here is that the uh, scapular spine and the acromion coming off it, the coracoid process coming anteriorly, and then the blade of our scapula makes this Y formation. Our patient is facing that way there, towards the ribs. Our humeral head then should sit directly in the center of this Y. Again, if the humeral head is this way, we've got a posterior dislocation. And if the humeral head is this way, we have an anterior dislocation. So those are our views. Now I'm going to cover a couple of common pathologies in the trauma setting. We're going to start with dislocations. We're going to look at a couple of common fractures. Then we're going to look at the AC joint and finally just some other soft tissue things that can happen around the shoulder joint. So section one, we're going to start with the most common type of dislocation and that's an anterior shoulder dislocation. I want to show you what these dislocations look like on different views and what to look out for. So here we have an AP view of the left shoulder. Again, here is our glenoid fossa, and we can see quite clearly that that humeral head is not sitting within that glenoid fossa. In fact, it's inferior and anterior to the shoulder joint. This is a classic spot where the, a person comes in, they're drooping their shoulder down like this, they're holding their um, arm slightly awkwardly, and the humeral head has come inferior and anterior and has popped out of that uh, glenoid fossa. On our apical oblique view, our modified trauma view, we can see that if we were to draw that triangle again and cut the line forward, we can see that the humeral head is far anterior to that um, glenoid fossa. And here we actually have a fractured dislocation, which is fairly rare, but we've seen this large portion of humeral head left behind that's been fractured off the main humerus. This is a complex dislocation. We've got a fractured dislocation anterior dislocation of the shoulder. If we were to look at our Y view of an anterior dislocation, again, the spine, the coracoid process and the blade, we can see that our humeral head is far anterior. So it's inferior and anterior to the patient. That's a classic anterior uh, dislocation. Let's have a look at some posterior dislocations. It can be quite tricky on the apical view. What we see here is that the shape of our humeral head is more of what they call a light bulb. You know, you can picture these are the bits where you screw your light bulb in. That's a little bump like that. You can see why it's called a light bulb. So it's less walking stick and more light bulb. That uh, humeral head has dislocated posteriorly and it's got some slight internal rotation. This view can be seen if a patient's got a really sore shoulder and they can't externally rotate for the AP view. The shoulder can be within the socket, but look like a posterior dislocation because they're holding it internally like this because of pain. So again, one view is one view too few, and we're going to need a separate view. And here's an example in a Y view. Unfortunately, I don't have an uh, apical oblique view, but here's a Y view. We've got our coracoid, our acromion, and our blade of the scapula, and we can see that the center of the humeral head is lying posterior to that Y the posterior dislocation. This is much less common dislocation. The vast majority of dislocations are going to be anterior. So let's have a look at a couple of common fractures that you'll see in the trauma setting. And it's just good to know these types of fractures because you can specifically look at those areas. Here we have a patient that's presented post fall. We can see that the, the um, AC joint looks normal. The distance here looks good. The head is sitting nicely within the glenoid fossa, not below the coracoid process, and we've got this nice walking stick shape. What we can see here is there's a fracture of the greater tuberosity. We've got quite a few muscles that attach to the greater tuberosity there. We've got our supraspinatus, our infraspinatus, as well as our teres minor, those rotator cuff muscles that are attaching there, causing the shoulder external rotation. You can imagine a, a hard fall onto that shoulder can cause a break at that uh, insertion site, the, glenoid, uh, the greater tuberosity of the humerus. Another common fracture is what's known as a bony bank heart. So a bank heart lesion is technically referring to the cartilage and soft tissue that lines the um, glenoid fossa. And what we have here 
is a break there of the anterior inferior rim of the glenoid. And what's happened here is this shoulder has dislocated anteriorly and inferiorly, and the connection, the um, impact between the, the top of the humeral head here and this anterior bony rim has caused a fracture here. And so it's, this is what's known as a bony bankart or an anterior inferior rim of glenoid fracture. An important place to look is a common injury in anterior shoulder dislocations. Here we have a very similar case. This humerus has um, dislocated anteriorly and the impact between this anterior inferior rim has caused a depression fracture here on the uh, head of the humerus and this is what's known as a heel sax lesion. Sometimes the shoulder will still be dislocated and you can see that the head of the humerus is impacted against this an anterior inferior rim, again, causing this depression fracture, a heel sacs lesion in the head of the humerus. Moving on now to clavicle fracture. Here we can see quite obviously a distal clavicular fracture. Most fractures of the clavicle are traumatic one, and most of them will occur in the mid shaft of the clavicle. But here we have a distal clavicular fracture. You're going to need another view here to see the extent of displacement here, whether this can be treated conservatively, which most clavicle fractures are, or whether there's going to need some surgical intervention. So moving on swiftly to section three, we're going to assess the AC joint. And what we use here is what's known as the Rockwood classification system. A Rockwood one, the inferior border of the clavicle will be in line with the acromion, and that AC ligament has only had a partial rupture. Rockwood 2, there's been rupture of that AC ligament, but the inferior border of the clavicle doesn't extend above the superior border of the acromion. A Rockwood 3 is where the inferior border extends above the superior border of our acromion, but the distance between the inferior border of the clavicle and the coracoid, the coracoclavicular ligament, is not more, so it's less than 25 millimeters, 2.5 centimeters. That's a Rockwood 3. Now, 4, 5, and 6 are all variations of a Rockwood 3. There's complete disruption of the coracoclavicular uh, ligament as well as complete rupture of the AC ligament. In a Rockwood 4, we're looking at a lateral view now, the uh, clavicle has completely broken away from the acromion and the um, coracoid and it's extended posteriorly. A Rockwood 5 is the same as a Rockwood 3, but now this time, this distance here, the inferior border of the clavicle and the coracoid is more than 25 millimeters. And rarely, you can see in Rockwood 6, there's an inferior displacement of that clavicle. And actually, this clavicle goes underneath the coracobrachialis and the bicep uh, tendon on that side. That's very rare. So you can see when we're looking at an x-ray, we can quite confidently give a Rockwood classification. And someone who can't see that x-ray would be able to under understand the extent of that injury just based on your Rockwood classification. So I've given you an example here. We can see that the inferior border of the clavicle is higher than the superior border of the acromion. So we know that we're dealing with a three or higher. You can see that um, the distance here um, when actually measured on a pack system is less than 25 millimeters. We know it's not a, uh, a Rockwood 5 then, and we know it's not a Rockwood 6. And I don't have the lateral, but if we were to take a lateral, we can see that this is not um, posteriorly displaced. So here we are dealing with a Rockwood 3 um, disruption of the AC joint. And finally, lastly, I want to touch just briefly uh, on non-shoulder features. And I'm only going to show one example here, but I want to show you it to show you that when we're looking at the shoulder, we need to look at the complete field of view. Any x-ray, you need to assess whatever is within that x-ray. So this is a young patient. How do we know that they're young? Well, they've still got growth plates that have yet to fuse. We can see here, this is actually really interesting. The acromion has a little os that uh, will eventually fuse. And sometimes this doesn't fuse, and this is what's called an osochromial. It's a normal anatomical variant. That's not a fracture. Importantly here, the coracoid process, that's not a fracture. These are all growth plates. We can ask ourselves the same question on an AP view, whether the alignment of the AC joint is right, whether this just distance is right. There's no uh, dislocation of um, the humerus, and there are no obvious fractures in this, um, this X-ray.
this patient that had a biking accident and complained of shoulder pain. But if we want to assess the lung volumes, we can see up here that there's actually no lung markings and what this patient has is a small pneumothorax on the right. And we would have never have seen that if we were focusing solely on the so shoulder joint. And I wanted to include this because any x-ray that has other features, we're looking at the shoulder, but it's got lung fields, you need to go and look. You might have an older patient who has a mass here and you can save them a lot of morbidity and mortality if you pick up other features that are not associated with their presenting complaint. So I hope that's helped. It's a brief whistle-stop tour through an approach to shoulder x-rays in a trauma setting. If you've enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you considered subscribing and liking this video. Let me know what other videos you want approaches to. If you want to approach to, say, a hip x-ray, I'm more than happy to do that. Follow me on the socials link. They'll all be in my description below. Again, go check out that book that's linked in the description if you want to find out more about accident and emergency radiology. Otherwise, I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.